I, I guess we're ready to start. I'm Jeff Bear. I do a podcast called Craft Beer Radio. It's different from the Should I Drink That guys that are they're all over podcasts. They're a lot more into doing local scene. I have a baby. Swing has a baby, so I'm not sure how he does it, but it keeps me from doing lots of fun things. Um, been doing a podcast since June of 2005. We have 145 numbered episodes out, and probably 50 or so other things, interviews, brewery tours, stuff like that. So we're up around 200 different things that we've podcasted. Uh, we do a little bit of video here and there, probably about 10 or so video shows. We just sprinkle them in on occasion. Um, we can get into why I'll do more video later, but um, not too important right now. I'm uh, Alex Seinfeld. Uh, I am a sometime podcaster. Uh, I did a, a podcast called Minute Tech where I did 65 episodes. Um, and then I uh, got a different schedule and it totally went away. Um, and I, I, so I've, I've uh, what I call faded that podcast, and I've actually started and faded two or three other podcasts. Um, so I, you might say that Jeff has his thing down just fine, and, I, and I'm, I'm still looking for mine, uh, which is probably true for most people. Um, so I, I, I think on the thing, I, I have a, uh, I'm listed there as uh, currently blogging, and I'm currently blogging on a, a blog called uh, Trash Stock, um, and just having fun with that. But, I guess it's preemptively. I was watch I wasn't here yesterday, but I was watching the podcasting one oh one and the grassroots online yesterday. And a lot of talk about monetization in your podcast. I don't have anything on here about monetization. So let me get that out of the way really quickly. You guys are gonna like me for my opinion. Do your podcast really well for a long time before you start looking for money. You're it's not gonna get rich. If you want to get rich quick, play the ball. That, that's pretty much my philosophy of monetization. Some people get lucky. But there's no get rich quick formula for podcasting. A lot of advertisers are still looking at the magazine way, CPM, you know, cost per thousand. So until you get three or four thousand listeners, it's not going to be worth your time putting ads in your podcast. You don't even get 10, 15 bucks. So if 10, 15 bucks is worth it for you, then I guess you can look at it. For you. That's, that's kind of my philosophy for podcasting or for monetizing. That, that was true. Really, yeah. Uh, <laughs> yesterday in the video podcast uh, presentation, they basically they say. Do it because you enjoy it. Um, if you enjoy it and somebody else enjoys it enough to pay you to do advertising, that's great. But do it initially because you enjoy it or you have a, a drive to do it. Um, Leo Laporte, go ahead, though. I've been doing it about three years now, over almost 400 episodes that I do of mine. And instead of looking, I mean, I would go to a meeting briefly, I would go to PC. And instead of working with national, what I did was in my local community, went to a car dealership, went to an internet service provider, went to um, a couple organizations that fit here, and I said, this is what I do, this is who listens to me. If you think that you can mark, I mean, if I will benefit you, yeah, exactly. here, please give me such and such. And they did. I mean, and I've been, I've been very lucky. I'm not getting rich off it, but it's justified me doing it. So I want to get into the things you need to know how to do well before you can do a solo podcast for a long time, and then then make money later. Is everyone okay with that? So the first thing I have to say is your RSS feed is your most valuable property. People subscribe to it, and if you have to change your URL to your RSS feed, it's a disaster because you got to get all those people to subscribe again the second time. It was hard enough to get the first time. So if you're starting a podcast or if you're already in there and have a bad URL. You know, you want to head that off as soon as possible. Um, change disastrous. What you want to do, think ahead, plan smartly, own your feed. Um, you know, I don't know if a lot of people use it anymore. I think a fair amount of people do, but back when podcasting was just starting out in 2005, when I was going to start in 2006, everyone was using FeedBurner. FeedBurner gave you good stats, told you how many listeners you had, but it was a feedburner.com URL, and you were locked in. It was vendor lock, and you couldn't. Get away from that. So if you wanted to do craftbeerradio.com as your URL, you'd have to start all over getting that audience. You can post shows in your old feed saying, subscribe to this feed, but you can't make them do that. You can just suggest it over and over and over again. So you will lose listeners if you have to change your feed. Don't get stuck with a stupid URL. When you're planning out your um, podcast feed, you know, try to stay away from my cool podcast on blogspot.com slash, you know, whatever. Um, for example, for a uh, Oh, my notes aren't up on that screen. Oh. Um, my XML feed is craftbeerradio.com slash craftbeerradio with a capital C, B, and R, because it's case sensitive, dot XML. And I could have done better. I should have just done podcast.xml, but I wanted the, um, 
URL to kind of spell it out a bit more. And um, so I would change my feed if I didn't have a nothing. So domain name slash podcast.xml is what I would recommend for everyone. Um, managing RSS data. Um, and when you first start out, you'll be tempted to hand edit your data, especially if you're not using a content management system, which we'll be getting into right down here. Uh, it's tedious and error prone. Uh, I did this for only the first eight or ten episodes of Craft Beer Radio because we hadn't had a CMS yet. And I post it, and I find out late the next morning that there was a feed about the problem validating the RSS feed. I forgot a close tag or something like that. Um, RSS feeds, for people who don't know, are XML files. So it's very particular on the formatting of it, and you have to have certain things in there for your aggregators like iTunes or um, iPodder to, uh, to download them. Um, if you do write it by hand, validate your feed. Um, there's a URL for the WC3 XML validation. It'll tell you if you made any stupid mistakes in your XML. My recommendation would be not to write XML by hand. Use some kind of feed management software. There are third-party services, which are ones that post it out on the internet. You gotta be worried about vendor locking with those. Make sure you can still own your feed URL if you use one of those. Uh, Self-hosted services would be things you would put on your web server, but that requires you have some technical knowledge about running PHP or CGI Perl or something on your web server. Desktop software would be a nice easy one. You just run it in your Mac or Windows and um, make your XML and you just upload it to where your feed belongs. Or integrated with the content management systems, the last one. And we'll be getting into some of these. Yeah, an example, example of third party services might be something like uh, uh, Mac.com if you're uh, producing things through your, or now it's me.com um, if you're producing things with your Mac on your iWeb page. Or even something like Blip.tv uh, where you're hosting things through Blip.tv. Um, when you fill out your thing as you're, as you're uploading, same thing with YouTube, that's essentially filling out your RSS feed. No, I can't endorse any of these except for Drupal. I went into it last week, week before, and found examples that looked good for each of these kind, but I can't endorse them. Uh, Podcast, Podcast Blaster is third-party software where you, you sign up for their website. It has a database where it keeps track of your shows, and then you can export the RSS back to yourself so you can upload it to your thing. So it's basically they're managing the database of your shows, giving you the file that you can put on your website. It seemed good. I never used it. Podcast generator would be the same kind of thing, except you run it on your website. It's PHP, so you have to know how to run a Linux server with Apache or a Windows server with Apache and PHP. And um, actually, the feed that it generates is, can be your podcast URL, so that it removes that uploading step. Feed for All is a cross-platform desktop software. It runs on Windows and Mac and Linux too, I believe. And I um, haven't used it, but it looked like a good option for doing it all on your desktop and uploading files. And then if you use a content management system that is podcast friendly, um, it'll take care of it automatically. You'll have to do some things like if Drupal install the iTunes audio module and stuff to make sure it does iTunes particular uh, tagging in your feed. But that's what I use. And we'll get into an example a little bit later of how Crafty Radio uses Drupal to post our podcasts, give you an idea of what the workflow looks like. And WordPress, I put it on there because it's very popular with other podcasters. I don't have any experience with it, but um, if you want to talk afterwards, we can talk about why I chose Drupal over the WordPress. All these slides are uh, up in PDF form on, on the web. At the end of the URL, at the end of the slide presentation, there will be a URL that you can write down. Improving your sound. So um, I haven't got any feedback from you guys yet. Was the XML thing kind of useful? Yes. Tell you things to avoid. Good. Um, so improving your sound. This is something that you know people who are starting out the podcast want to know. How can I make a podcast better? So uh, good and bad uses of money. We'll start off with that one. Um, this is only from my personal experience. I'm sure there'll be varying opinions. Uh, if you're starting out using a built-in mic on your laptop and whatnot, you know get something that's off the computer. But I think that's more of a 101 type thing. So we'll get into 201 where, like, what kind of microphones do we use? Um, when we started out, we were using uh, a dynamic microphone. It's the ones you hold, you see up on rock, you know, on music stages and whatnot. Um, Shure is the big company. You know, they have the Shure um, something by, but it's very popular. I'm sure most of the podcasters have used those at some point. I found some on the 
a knockoff from Navy called the Navy SC5, and I got those for like 15 bucks. I got two of those. How do you spell it? How do you spell it? N A D Y. Okay. And um, I'm really happy with them. I've been using them for five years now. I use now we use condenser mics in the studio, but I use those when I'm doing out mobile recording, and, and they work great. So um, those mics are worth it. Getting the seventy, eighty dollar condenser mics, I got them. Did I notice a huge difference? Might not be the best use of money up front. Um, and if you have a noisy studio, it's actually worse because the, the dynamic mics have a very short pickup area. So you stay on mic, you hear you, it ignores your computer running, your cat meowing, all this other stuff. Where it, it, crying, yeah, yes. But when you get a condenser mic, they're a lot more live. So you'll hear a lot more of your environment. So if you have a noisy studio, you actually really think you're wasting money for a condenser mic, let me say. Um, I need to get out of here to pull up my notes because I thought they were going to be shown on the screen. Because I wrote down a list of good and bad uses of money. Okay, um, pop filters are the other thing. We'll get back to the screen in one second. Uh, pop filters, you know, when you see like people in the recording studio, the microphone, they have the stocking in front of it. That breaks up the sound pressure wave, so you don't get the pop, 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 a lot of popping. So either get good at talking beside your mic instead of to your mic. Or get a pop filter, and that'll help improve your sound. Pop, pop filters can be made out of an old wire coat hanger and, and stuff in a pair of nylons. Yeah. Uh, and and low sock works too. Yeah. Yeah. Socks are a little bit too thick, but uh, nylons work. Yeah, anything that will keep you from blowing air into your microphone, because it's that sound pressure wave that hits the diaphragm and it maxes up the and it doesn't sound good. A sound mixer is useful if you have more than one person doing your podcast. You have two people. It's really helpful to have them both at the same audio levels, and a mixer makes that easy because you have two separate inputs where you can mix those. Uh, the sound mixer I use is, I think, like an $8 mixer. It's a USB output. It's from Alesis, A-L-E-S-I-S. The eight. Uh, yeah, the multi-mix eight is what I have. And uh, it works well. It has all kinds of fun noise distortions you can play with when you first get it, but then you'll soon forget about those. You just do a real podcast. Um, that's useful. Um, Compressor limiter. This is kind of the next step once you get decent sound. Um, I have another thing from Elisa's called a compressor. It's actually one of these rack mount things you see in like a rock concert. And what it does is it lets me manage my input signal. And actually, I have a section on compressor limiters. I'll get to explain that with some graphics. So we'll get to that in a minute. Software. You can use free software like Audacity to edit the podcast. I use pay software from Adobe called Audition. And it has Two things that if Audacity have, I would use Audacity. And that is a multi-band compressor. And we'll get into that a little bit later. And the simplest thing, which we can't believe they don't have, you know when you're who's done who hasn't done audio editing for the podcast? Okay. So everyone else has. So I'm sorry for the three people that don't know what I'm talking about. But you have your waveform, you got an um in there. And you want to take that um out. So you highlight it and you delete it. And it takes the two pieces and slams them together. And if the waveform's not similar, there's going to be a straight line. It's going to give you a click in your audio editing. Adobe Audition will crossfade both of those, so it's a more smoother thing. So you can get in really, like, if it's a uh by itself, Audition can take that out pretty good. There's silence on both ends. But I find that there's a uh running right into your next sentence. So those are really hard to extract with Audition without getting a click, where the, or with Audacity. If I call it audition, it will crossfade it. And you can really get in there and surgically remove all the bad bits of your podcast. A waste of money, high end cables. Um, I paid some money to upgrade my cables and noticed no difference. The, the cheapy cables that I bought from China on the internet were fine. When I bought the real audio cables for my microphones, I wasted $45 with no real, no, $40, $60 with no, no appreciable improvement. Um, professional studio headphones. You know, a lot of people get those huge things. I found that if you go to Best Buy and get the Sony studio ones that are about this big, they block out enough outside sound that it allows you to monitor your voice levels very well. So don't go overboard in headphones. I don't think many people would, but I really had problems thinking of wastes of money. Okay, back to the slides. How to set a level, we've got a graphic for that coming up. Noise and reverb control. Um, 
talk about noisy studios and that and condenser mics before. So uh, how loud is your computer? You have a gaming PC, you know, with a 500 watt power supply and 16 fans in there. Might not be what you want in your studio when you're recording your podcast. Um, laptops are good because they're pretty quiet. The caveat is if you're using the onboard mic, the cooling fans are not quiet compared to the onboard mic. But if you have those run out to a that soundboard or microphones, laptops are pretty quiet. Um, my, my PC, it's a, it's a Dell Optiplex. It's an older one. All we use it for recording. And it has just one little fan in there, and it's a low speed fan, and it's nice and quiet. Um, carpeting sets up sound. Uh, when I, we, for one point, we were doing. Uh, podcasts in my townhouse and we had hardwood floors put in and it got really live. Um, so if you're thinking about where to do your studio, find a carpeted room, that'll help a lot. Uh, interesting uh, side of that is that uh, if you're doing your podcast in a public location, think about uh, the, the, the fans, the cars driving by, the, the well, um, marketing over coffee, they do it in a uh, uh, Dunkin' Donuts, and you hear the clanking of the dishes, and you want that sort of yeah, thing. Yeah, it all depends on what you want, right? Because when I'm doing podcasts out at a beer fest or something, you know, you want the background noise. Mm -hmm. You want that ambiance in your show. If you're doing a, a, a controlled studio show, that's where it's like. My, my first podcast was at the Beehive uh, down the south side, and there was a constant drone of the overhead fan that was on. Mm -hmm. And I, I didn't know anything about sound at the time, so I didn't, didn't know what to do about that. That's just one thing to be aware of. Um, you've seen in, in studios how they have all that foam on the walls, you know, the pumps and stuff. That's to suck up the sound. So I was going to take pictures of my studio, but I didn't have time. So I got open cell foam from work. We use a pack hard drives and stuff. And I stapled them all together, so I have these big sheets of gray and pink foam on my walls. And uh, four, four sets of 4 by 8 sheets of foam really cleaned up the reverb. And there's tons of reverb in this room. I'm not sure if you guys are noticing. But it just sucks that right off. It works well. Um, so you can hang blankets. You know, if you just want to hang some blankets over your picture frames, that could be a, a portable way of making your studio and tearing down your studio. Um, some people, carpet would be better than the foam I use. If I could find some old carpet that wasn't all nasty, you could cut squares of that and hang it on your wall. The eggshell foam is not really that expensive. Yeah. You, you can, I think you can still get it up in pianos and stuff in blocks. Which is a really good store for sound equipment. All right, so real quick on setting your levels, uh, avoid clipping. What clipping is is here. This is a typical display. This is in Audition. Audacity should look the same way. Um, I've never used GarageBand to do a podcast, even though I have a Mac here. Um, so I'm not sure what it looks like. But so we have the center line, which is infinite dB, and then it's these negative numbers till it gets to zero. Anything above zero gets clipped off because it's out of range of what the recording's expecting. I don't know all the technical stuff. So if your sound goes up to here, it can't go any higher. It gets shot, locked off. It gets clipped off. And that makes for really bad. Like, anyone anyone tuned into this stuff yesterday online? You know, at the end of the session, or if you're less than 10 people in the camera, it gets really clippy because the mic's too sensitive. They know what I'm talking about. Um, <laughs> That all went over this red line here. So your peaks of your content should be between minus 1 to minus 6 dB. So minus 6 is right here. So that's a good example um, of a good level. And if you have a soundboard, you can turn up the level on your mics or go into the software on your computer and try to make your mic louder. <coughs> you want your sound wave kind of like that. Um, you could probably go a little bit lower than 6. I mean, 9 to 12 would still be kind of okay. If you're using sound beds on your music, don't have your background sound be too loud. Make sure it's at least 12 dB lower than your voice. So if you've got a sound bed on here, there isn't one. But you know, you wouldn't, you wouldn't you'd see blue line right there. And I wouldn't want to go any higher than 18, minus 18 on there. Um, don't mix your sound bed in too loud. <clears throat> Better sound <coughs> technology. Dynamics compression. Oh, sure. yes. one, does anybody have any experience with uh, recording like in big open areas? Um, I'm not sure I don't like what do you mean? Um, well, um, I'm, I want to do a, a B cast on troubleshooting uh, menu equipment. Okay. So I'm going to be in a big parking lot with a truck next to me. Uh -huh. And I imagine there's probably going to be reverb from the equipment 
you know, I mean, when you're out in the student, out in the environment, you know, I would just, you know, like we talked about when he was doing the podcast at the coffee shop, right? I mean, the, the clinking of the china and stuff, that's part of the ambiance that you really want in the background. So if you're outside, you might want some automobile noise or whatnot, just let people know you're outside. Some of that will actually improve. Now, if you're standing beside a running path bus, you know, that diesel engine is yeah. at you, you know, you might want to move or do something like that. But as far as hanging carpet outside, yeah. no, 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 just try to find a place that, something you might not notice is like when you talk about the fan, you know, said beehive or whatever, yeah. you know, there's this frequency that you might not notice because we can block it out, but when it comes on the recording, it's there and it's actually, it's not that the people listening can't block it out, but it's taking out information that your voice normally would and makes it harder for you to, to hear you. So, because the, the amount of information that you're hearing from me right now, like the bits that I'm sending through the air, is a lot more than what's recorded online, on you know, recording. Uh, there's a lot more nuance that you can hear that's not recorded the tape. Okay. And we're going to get into making your MP3 and bitrate compression. But dynamics compression is different than bitrate compression. Um, so if we go back to the previous slide, dynamics compression is to basically level this out more. Bring the lows up, take the highs down, so you have more of a square. Um, squares are bad if you're doing music. Like classical music has a very high rate of dynamic compression. Really quiet, quiet, really loud, louds. And then pop music, they call it two by four on here because they put it on such high compression, there's no dynamic range at all in pop music. So there's software compressors. And you'll find these in uh, almost any audio software, Audacity Audition. I keep saying Audacity. I think I forgot to say it's an open source sound editor that's free. And I would recommend everyone use that unless you pay for something. Is that Mac compatible? Yes, there's a Mac and PC right there. So sorry. Definitely, guys, you know, yell, yell at me if I'm forgetting something or, or chime in and ask me questions. I'm and that's at uh, sourceforge.net. Yeah, it's easy. It's just Google for it. Yeah, you won't miss it. Google for Audacity. And um, software compressors, you can hook them up to compress your inbound signal, but generally it's a post-production thing. When you're done editing, you run through a compressor and you'll you do the compression. And I'll show you what that means in a second. Then there's a hardware-based compressor limiter, which I'll show you also in a second. Those are better for compressing your signal on the input. I'll show you what the benefit for that is. Um, post-production. There's uh, some more things you can do to improve your sound. Normalization. What normalization does, so we have the uh, same same window. That's a dead marker. Is that a marker again? Uh, nope, that's it. Well, I brought some, so that's good. I'll still the green marker. So we've got the same thing. There's our zero line. And it's, just pretend the tops are minus one line. So say you record your audio. And it only gets that big. What you can do is if you run normalization on it, it'll do a computer algorithm on that. And it'll find the highest and lowest points. And it'll expand the it'll amplify those out so they hit the minus one. So it'll make your noise as cool as it can be. So you can use that to fix your audio once you record and normalize it. So what it will do is it'll take this and it'll stretch it all out so these highest and lowest points will be at the optimal volume that you want for your uh, recording. So does that mean, for example, if we did not pick up good sound from a distance, that we could fix it in that way? If your entire audio is low. Yes. Yeah, you can make it, you can amplify it out. And basically it's the same as amplification, but it, it looks at your whole thing, figures out what the best amplification it can do is, and then does that. So that's why it's called normalization. And we can do that through Audacity? Yes, Audacity does that. I, I don't know about ProGen. Or the other softwares that people are using. Can anybody use Final Cut? I do know a person who uses Final Cut, and he is a professional sound guy and a podcaster. Um, um, I, for any videos, I mean, even still, if you're doing a video podcast, then maybe you might be using that. But no, I mean, the guy I know well, is basically right. I, don't know yeah. I use Pro Tools for my audio editing because um, it just meshes so nicely with. But I mean, Pro Tools is expensive. You can certainly use Final Cut. I know a guy who does professional podcasts. He's a full-time. His podcast isn't his full income. He does voiceover work and stuff like that, and he uses that or 
Final Cut to do his podcast other things. To do his um, the audio for, the audio editing of his audio podcast. He uses Final Cut, yes. I don't have any experience with it. Because it has probably just Google Final Cut normalization. Yes. I'm just saying, if, if he, if he does it, I trust that it works. So, what's the practical value of normalization? And does that also raise like your noise floor? It will raise your noise floor. So, that's why compression is better than normalization. <clears throat> so, there's two kinds of compression. We talked about dynamics compression, and there's MP3 compression. Um, it's a post production thing on here. And uh, I have detail slide on that as well. There's another thing called levelization. It's kind of just a one-off word. It's not an industry standard word. There's an application called a level label. So say you're doing a telephone interview, and you're really loud, and the guy on the phone is really quiet. So you have high peaks when you talk, and low peaks when he talks. There's an application called a level later. And you can write that down, because I don't have it on the slide. Level later. Google for that. It will do normalization on that, but it will kind of do It'll make the quiet guy loud and kind of level eight your entire podcast. Uh, I've never had to use it myself, but I know that it's a pretty popular thing, so it's probably worth looking into. I have a question for you. Sure. What if there's some background noise that you want to get rid of, but you don't want to get rid of your voice? Yeah, you need to take a uh, college course on audio processing. <laughs> 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 you can do things where you can cut out certain frequencies. So if there's a certain frequency of hum, you can try to cut it out, but then you're going to take that frequency out of the voice talking, so it's not going to sound very natural. Um, I've done shows where I've had noises that I've tried to cut out, and, and I've had both well, never said I've been completely successful at it. I think that really comes down to kind of the old adage, crap in, crap out. You're only going to be able to do as good as your initial recording is. Yeah. And, well, we were yeah. recording a session and then suddenly we hit the next door and decided to start playing this guitar. Yeah. And then we started playing the drums and it just completely bled into our recording. Yeah, yeah it, it's, especially if it's, if, if it's a sound for a fan or sound from electricity or it's constant frequency, like I said, you might have a chance of taking that out with frequency reduction. But if it's a guy playing a drum next door, <laughs> if, if his left. We can use compression to help with that. So what, here's a, um, what the nearest compression does is it makes loud, loud sounds softer and softer sounds louder. Um, softer sounds louder is actually called expansion. It can help keep you from clipping. It gives you a fuller sounding audio and more consistent volume levels. So this is a graphic from Adobe Audition. And I think it summarizes well to help you figure out what compression means. And um, so what we have is. Anything that is below 24 dB. So right here, this dot is at 24 dB. Anything that's below 24 dB, we keep the same. Anything that's louder than 24 dB, you probably do a 3.48 to 1 compression on. So anything that's louder than 24 dB gets kind of de-amplified. And what you can do is you can do it in additional progression steps. So anything that you can say, anything that is, what you want to avoid is that clipping, right? So like. What clipping means is anything that's louder than minus 1 dB, or, or 0 dB actually, anything that's louder than minus well, 0 dB has an infinite compression, right? And that sounds bad. So the you want to try to head that off by putting more and more pressure on those loud sounds to keep them from hitting 0 dB. Does that make sense? Did I explain that well? Okay. And then what you can do is you, for the quiet sounds, and it's not demonstrated here, is you can say anything that is quieter then 70 dB, instead of de amplify it, amplify that. Make it two or three times louder. So it'll make the quiet sounds louder and the loud sounds quieter. Yeah, it's interesting. Uh, I use GarageBand. It does not give this level of, uh, of editing. Okay. But it does have uh, a, a list of about uh, 16 or 20 different voice type things where I think they just do automatic compression. Yeah, and they, they kind of remove you from the details of compression. <laughs> This is what a hardware compressor looks like. This is half of it because it can be a stereo. But we only use it in mono on our show. And we have the same kind of things here. We have our threshold. So this, what this is, is this is after my soundboard, but before my computer. So I'm acting on the sound before it goes to recording. So it helps me from clipping my sound even more. I'm recording garbage in, garbage out. We talked about a little bit ago. 
this helps me put better stuff in onto tape, onto the hard drive. And um, it, it makes you, like, if you get excited and start yelling, this thing will catch it and you won't be clipping in your recording. So I'm spoiled. I really, I don't know, I don't think I could live without this anymore. And this cost me 60 bucks or so. And um, I don't think you need it right away, but I want you to know that it exists because it is helpful. So the way this works is, it's just like that picture we saw. Here's our threshold. So we set the dB here. So we say at minus 10, we want it to start compressing. We want it to start compressing at a ratio of 4 to 1. Attack and release are some settings like, if the sound goes over that, how long before I start fixing it? And when the sound goes back under it, how long before I stop compressing it? They're really technical things. I can't tell you what to set those to. If you have them set wrong, you hear this pumping where it's just like louder, quieter, louder, quieter, louder, quieter. So you gotta avoid that. But again, this is this is beyond you know 201 type stuff. Really. I just want you to know it exists. You can um, do output gain too, so that can help adjust your overall volume. Then there's a noise gain. And these are useful for you. Um, so if you're doing your podcast and you want a really quiet studio and you, you have fan noise from your computer or whatever, you can say Anything that's below minus 30, minus 40, minus 50 dB, don't let through. It's a gate. It closes the gate. This turns red, and there's no sound being passed through to your computer. Then when you start talking, it's loud enough that it beats this threshold. This turns green, and sound goes in. Yeah. So how do you determine that? Do you just record your studio empty for a few seconds to see where that yeah. threshold yeah. is? Okay. Yeah. The, um, I can't use this. I do a beer podcast where we're tasting beer, drinking beer, and part of the ambiance that we need is us sniffing and taking sips. And some people may physically sick of hear us to do that. <laughs> they don't listen to the show anymore. But if I had a noise gate that knocked out, that took out the, it just didn't sound right. So when I first got it, I tried to use a noise gate to keep the fans out. But I had too many subtle sounds that I needed to keep on my podcast to make it sound right. Any questions? Okay, from creating, creating your MP3, size versus quality. Um, a lot of you probably have sort of figured this out after doing a couple podcasts, but 201, let's refresh it a little bit. Um, mono or stereo. Mono, you can get, you know, basically double the quality for the same bit rate because you don't have two audio channels. Basically, there's, there's some cross compression, you can get three peaks figured out, and it's not quite double. But um, if your show works in mono, it's mono. You don't need the stereo. I would say do it in mono. Um, some people like if there's two people like on my show, there's two people talking. They'll they'll off balance the mics a little bit, so I'm in your left ear a little bit, and Greg would be in your right ear for a little bit. You know, just not not completely. Not like seeing so like two little guys sitting on your shoulders. But if you but if you off balance them a little bit, it helps differentiate who's talking. Um, for me, I didn't think it was worth the cost of the additional file size for downloads. So we, we just mix ours in the mono. And it's a personal call that you can use. And then bitrate, that's how much compression you put on it. And, um, so when you make MP3s, you've got these big WAV files that you recorded, and too big to download on the internet, so you got to compress them down to an MP3. And MP3 goes and takes out certain bits of information that you really don't need to hear to make it a smaller file. The smaller, the, the bitrate is basically the, the, the crank that you turn on, how much you want to squish that down. So the lower the bitrate, the more stuff you're taking out, and at a certain point, you're not going to sound very good. You're going to sound like a radio, and you're going to sound like a telephone. Not exactly like, but you get the idea. So you got to find a bit rate that works for you. For me, I use 48 kilobits per second mono, and uh, it works good. And it's a lot smaller than 128 kilobits, which is kind of like the default MP3 setting. So you can mess around with lowering your bit rate. And do a bunch of them. Do 128, do a 56, do a 48, do a 40, do a 24, and pick the lowest one you're happy with. And then that's less file, less file size that you'll start to down. What's, what's good in a file name? So with iTunes and iPods, what the? Hey, we're on the internet. Yeah, the projector just turned off. No, but the, the actual projector itself, just hit the power button on the remote. It'll control. It's, it's on. Oh, well, you mean talk to the, uh, yeah. Interesting. Now, now hit the, now hit it again. <laughs> and 
then you're gonna have to hit the button over there. <laughs> okay, so um, Alex, you want to try to get the on? Sure. <laughs> <laughs> And I'll try to keep going on yep. what we're talking about. So uh, naming your MP3 um, with iTunes and iPods, it really doesn't matter because they hide all that from you and all they see is the tags that you put in your MP3s. But not everything is an iPod. So some people will see only your file name when they're going through their MP3 player to play your show. So you need to make your file name make sense. So um, what I recommend is um, you got to find something that works for you but identifies your show. So what I find is that you use an abbreviation for your show name. I'm proud to be a radio, so CBR is the abbreviation that's really taken over. I use a dash, and I use a show, a show number, 145. Then I put the date, so... It doesn't sound Yeah. Dot MP3. Okay. Pardon? So it, it gives a lot of information in there. It sorts, if there's multiple CBRs, they sort in the right order. So when someone's looking through it on your on their non-iPod, someone's looking at it on the non-iPod, it'll be in order and everything. Makes sense? So put some thought into how your files will sort for those poor souls that don't have. This blinking is probably shutting off. You'll have to wait a minute until it until it goes off and put it back up. <laughs> okay, any questions? Because I need my video for the next slide. So what you guys got? What you got for me? Where did you get your equipment? Musiciansfriend.com. They offer some uh, rebates all the time, and uh, prices are pretty good. There's a couple other websites that lots of people use. I don't remember what they are off the top of my head. What's your favorite beer? What's that? What's your favorite beer? Oh, that's not fair. What's your favorite song? I mean, it all depends on your mood, and the time of year, and everything. What's your favorite Hell One? What's that? What's your favorite Hell One? Favorite? Hell One. Oh, oh. <laughs> Does uh, Stats My Walk count? No. Beer. Beer. Oh. beer question. <laughs> I just limited it from general down to a specific. Come on. Can you guys see it over there? Can you see that little screen? They're now it's off. You should be able to turn it back on. And... There we go. Is that a laptop or a desktop that's hooked up to I looked up to it's hooked up to my laptop. But there's some kind of switcher thing and it's also. got a video out on the laptop, you're gonna have to toggle it probably. No, you shouldn't have to. It's powering up. Well it's still showing up on that screen. That screen here is the projector, even though the V sync was kind of on it. So Jeff, when you go out, which one do you take with you? Because when I was on the podcast, I just took my iPod with the microphone, and that seemed to have worked. Okay. Yeah. I mean, the, I'm just curious, which, what the, do you take uh, with you for a moment? I've never used any of the recording things for iPods. I know it used to not be very good quality. It, it was really good iPod. Okay. So I think they've gotten better. You know, yeah. Higher quality bit rates, you can record waves, things like that. It's work. Um, I've had two recorders that I've used in the past. Has anyone ever heard of the MP3 comic player called an Eye River? So they used to make really good equipment. They don't make fancy stuff anymore. And they had a hard drive one which had line in uh, and optical ends and stuff like that. It was the IHP 130. And uh, I broke the LCD screen on it, but it still had a little remote control. So I still use that to record stuff. I hook a microphone up to it and do mobile stuff. And then I also have a recorder from Zoom. It's called the, uh, it's from Samsung. It's called the Zoom H4. And uh, it's this little thing, it looks like a stun gun because it has two microphones on there. You might have seen the stun gun little thing that um, should have driven that kind of stun gun. Hey, yeah, we're back on. ID3 tagging was the next thing we're talking about. And the ID3 tags are information that's embedded in your MP3. And like when you go into your iPod on iTunes and it has your show title or show names, that's where it gets it from, from your ID3 tags. So you need to make. ID3 tags are made for songs, not podcasts. So you kind of have to adapt what you feel like this artist, and then there's album. You're a podcast, you don't have an album. So what do you put in then? Do I put in Jeff Barrett, Greg Weiss for the artist, and then Crappy Radio for the album? Doesn't work very well. You put in your show name for both, is what I end up doing. Um, ID3 tag editing software, you can use iTunes to do this. Uh, on Windows, there's one called MP3 tag. And I still use it. I use my VMware virtual machine to use Windows because it works very well for me. So here's here's the example of the file names. 
we do a, a pre-show, which is the extras one, and a post-show and extras two. So they kind of bookend our main show. Here we talk all about beer. Here we talk about whatever's on our minds. It really lets us. There's a tip for 201, keeping your podcast on topic. Do pre-show and post-show, so you need it out of your system, so you can keep your main show on topic. I mean, seriously, it works. There's lots of people that started doing it because they felt the need to vent in the main show and took their show off topic. So here is what the MP3 tag software pull-down looks like. That's what the screenshot's from. So my title. I titled the beginning, again, show identifier, episode identifier, and then name of the show, artist and album, or the name of the podcast. Put in the area. Just put in track number to match this. I don't take the time anymore because I don't think it matters. Doesn't take so long to type 145 right there. Right? <laughs> Genres. I put a podcast. You can put. It's really an open field. You can put whatever you want there. Comment. I put my licensing material. I, we release our stuff under the Creative Commons license, uh, non-commercial by attribution, share alike. So if you wanted to remix my podcast and give it away for free, I let you do that. So. You could put a regular copyright on there, review with all of all rights, whatever. Um, I figure it's good to attach the license to your content when you put it out, so I use the comments field for that. Are the uh, 128s just a different thing? The 128s are ones that I don't put on the internet. I save those from my archive. So they're 128 bits. They're fuller quality, and I just got them in case I ever need them for something. So I save off the 128s, and then I save off the, the 48s. So do you also save your original WAV files? Or I, get, I The 128 mono, there's plenty of bits that I don't need to waste space saving the WAV files. Questions about tagging? Does everyone know what tagging means today? Okay. Yeah, just think it out so it makes sense. And think about those guys at the Poor Souls don't use an Apple product for some podcasts. Hosting your podcast. Uh, we're going to go a little bit like Okay, so how do I host my podcast? You know, what happens if I get famous and have 10,000 downloads? You know, what can I my servers handle it? Can they handle the bandwidth? Um, so things to look for in a hosting. Provider. Well, first thing, own your domain. That blogspot.com stuff. I say get off that. Get buy a domain. But you know, if you use Namecheap, it's eight dollars a year. If you get a host like host that I'm going to tell you about, it's it's six ninety five a month for and. If you can't spend that, then I guess use Blogspot. But if you think you're going to do something with your podcast, get a domain, get a good host right away. But once you own your domain, you can switch cross hosts. If you own your domain and your podcast feed is on your domain, you're not locked into anything. So you can switch hosts left and right until you find one you're happy with. Upload bandwidth, the most important thing if you're hosting a podcast. You're going to be sending files out to the world. You need to make sure that they can support your upload, you know, your upload needs or they're not going to cap you if you get too popular. Storage space, you're going to be storing MP3s. You know, I have over 200 MP3s up on my server, and I have a host that gives us virtually unlimited space, so I don't have a problem with that. But if you're only allowed a couple hundred gigabytes, you can fill that up in a couple years if you're not careful. So plan ahead and make sure your host still has enough storage space. Speed caps, not as important, but when you're putting out your podcast, and it's going to take 30 minutes for listener X to download it because you're uploading speed from your server, it's too slow. It could leave for a bad user experience. So see if you know, see how long it takes your podcast to download off of your server. And then reliability. You don't want to distance down all the time. I use a host called. I don't. I don't have a slide for this. Let's see. What's the next one? Hosting. Yeah. I use a host called Bluehost.com, and. Um, they're all glad to offer a good service really cheap because they just sell it by the boatload. And you get relatively good customer service for you know giving so little. And there's if you need more customer service, you need better support than they can give you, instead of paying six ninety nine a month, you're paying some hundred a month. So there's like no tier between them in getting, you know, where you're actually paying them enough to care about you. So and now they're offering it for three ninety five. Oh, right. Really? Limited time offer. Yeah, there you go. Sign up. Sign up for a two-year contract, three ninety five a month. Costs almost nothing to get your podcast for two years. Now, I should say they don't have your auto magic podcast then. They have some wizards to help you install WordPress or Drupal or other CMS where you can upload the stuff yourself. But this doesn't cover the software to do your podcast. This is just the website hosting that you can put your software on. 
So keep that in mind too. So if you're really scared and you don't think that you can set up a WordPress for it, then maybe this isn't the right, you know, the right suggestion. She's looking at me like, what do you want me to do? So uh, I, honestly, I don't mean well, instead of using WordPress.org where you use their software, go to WordPress.com where you have a podcast.wordpress.com. Yeah, yeah I, I'm sorry, I don't have any good recommendations on third-party services that help you do all the technical stuff. But um, now, I, I for one, I've always done the root of podcast.blogspot.com or podcast.wordpress.com because I don't want to have to deal with uh, setting my own server or something like that. Trade-off is you're locked into that company. Right. right? So right. you got to figure out what works for you. And I'm not going to say you're a bad person for using a hosted service. I want my freedom. I want, if they try to be crap, I want to be able to take my stuff and go. And with no impact. I actually, a perfect example of that is GeoCities, after what, 15 years, is now shutting down. As of, if you have anything on GeoCities, October 26th is their cutoff date. I have a bunch of stuff on GeoCities. So, like, one more thing about Bluehost, if you guys are interested unlimited bandwidth, unlimited storage. They've been raising and making their limits bigger and bigger. And about a couple months ago, they just said, Screw it. Unlimited everything, pretty much. Blue hosting company? Bluehost.com. Bluehost? Yeah. And actually, they have a sister company called Host Monster, which is a little bit cheaper. I'm not sure. <laughs> I don't think why they have two companies. Just like to recommend another good host is Lunarpages.com. They've got a good deal. Okay. Um, there, are, there are a bunch of good ones out there. I would not recommend using GoDaddy for hosting. They're fine for doing a registration. Their hosting kind of sucks. Okay, I got two slides left. Let me go through them really fast, and because we're technically over, but it's lunchtime, so I will go as long as you guys want to go. But um, two slides are fast. Posting your podcast, a podcast-friendly CMS is the way to go. Um, you don't have to FTP files, you don't have to do all this work making RSS, you just put in some information, you hit submit, and your podcast is up. You want one that automatically manages your RSS feed? Good feature is having a flash player on your website, so people can just go to your website and play and they'll play the podcast right there. And uh, one that's capable of audio and video would be a nice bonus in case you decide you want to branch out into video. I have an um, example of how we do a Cracker Radio, but I'll put that last. And let's talk about um, collecting statistics for your website. This is the last slide, I promise. Yeah, last slide. Um, smart layout of your website helps make the blogs more understandable. Logs meaning either if you analyze the logs yourself or if Google analyzes your logs or whatever. If you have control to lay out your podcast, your URLs make sense. Uh, for example, the file names, you know, things like that. Just something to keep in mind. I don't really have any great examples on it. Layout, but something to keep in mind. Log analysis software. I use one called AW Stats. It comes with the Bluehost service. Um, I should look up Google Analytics because I bet you it gives you a really cool info. Um, you put a little job thing, a JavaScript thing on your web page, and they know every time someone goes to your page and they, you know, do all the Google flu on it. WordPress does nice stuff too on that. Okay. Now, uh, what stats matter? Now, this is the really the thing. So you have your stats collected, but you might not know what to look at. You know, what should you care about? Uh, on AW Stats, it has a section for files downloaded. So in there, you can see all your MP3 files, how many downloads you got off of your files. When someone asks me how many listeners I have, I can tell them I have people, 3,000 people download the show. And I can do that because I look at last week's show that's been up there for seven days and see how many downloads it's got. And that's how I know roughly I have 3,000 weekly listeners. Uh, bandwidth's another good way to calculate it. If you know that you've served 800 gigabytes this year and you know your show bandwidth or your shows are typically 28 megabytes, you can use a quick division to figure out roughly how many downloads you got. So that's another way you can kind of skim your cat. This has a link to lots of resources that I talked about today, um, links to all the equipment I use, links to this slideshow. So we can write that down. Here's mine and Alex's information. Uh, Jeff Bear on Twitter, and Jeff at Craft Beer Radio. Dot com is my email. And um, I'll take questions. Should I do the, okay, do you guys want me to do the show you craft your radio thing or do you want me to take questions? Show you the craft your radio thing? Yeah. I'm going to go help with questions.
And while you're talking, I'm going to let you know, um, what iTunes we consider, and I'm anonymous, mm -hmm. iTunes we consider a good CMS? iTunes isn't really the CMS, because you still have to post the I mean, on oh my so. .NET. Okay. Oh, .NET? I, I don't have yeah. any personal experience. Okay. So do you have a WordPress blog or? No, I don't. What? Well, you suggest? Well, the computer itself, personally, I have I have a WordPress that has the same as the target for a tall library, which I think there's two structure here, but it does a lot of the posting of sites here. It doesn't have to be, it's a plugin, so you install WordPress, you install this plugin to WordPress, and it does a lot of stuff on that. Okay, so I should get a workshop. Yeah. Dot org. Yes. Yeah, it was just a little angle. Right. Oh, my God. 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 I, I highly recommend Drupal as a, as a podcast that gives you tons and tons of flexibility, but again, you really have to want to get in and tweak and geek around with your website. If you don't want to, then Drupal is probably not the best answer, but I don't want you to do anything that you want to do. So when we're posting a podcast, I just go to um, create content, and I do an audio content, and it gives me this list here. I want to post to my main podcast feed. And I upload the, the MP3 file. Now, because I have my MP3 tag with the tag information, it automatically pulls the title and, and the other information out. The only thing I have to write is a body. So I'll go to. So, say I want to upload this, um, this MP3 right here. Which is one I'm about to post once I to get a tag. So you just put that in, you put in your body, and then once you hit upload, you'll get. I'll just jump to the one that's already posted. And here's here's the uh, what what it gives you for our MP3. So I just did that step. I click the link, I filled in the body, I hit submit, and I get what we have here. So I get the flash player from Craft Beer Radio. And uh, do I still have an internet connection? I guess I do. It, it pulls all this stuff out of the ID3 tags. And then, you know, this information is all given from the body. And then users can comment, they can download directly from the website, things like that. So it, my RSS is automatically generated and everything like that. So it really makes the workflow simple. Any questions? That's Drupal. Drupal, are you free? Yes. Uh, it's open source software. Uh, I'm sure there are third parties that will um, post Drupal for you and do all the hard, scary stuff so you can just use it. Um, Drupal out of the box is not a podcast software. It's just a content management system. So you need to install the audio module, the audio iTunes module. Like I said, it's not it's not the pan part. But if you're doing your podcast and you know, it's something you want control over and to do everything you want, I have to recommend it. Any other questions? Can I get some feedback? How was it? Very good. Very good. Thank you. I'm still absorbing. Yeah, I mean, 45 minutes was rough. I'm at 55. And uh, so I tried to cover some things so you just know what to look for when you hit that problem, hit that growing uh, Jeff, what's your listenership in your podcast? 3,000 listeners. We are doing it since June 2005, and I just checked this day and we have about 2 million downloads. How's your demographics? Is it mostly from the Pittsburgh area? Or is uh, so it's mostly the United States. It's all over the world. Most of the beers we drink aren't available to everyone in foreign countries, so mostly the United States. Um, uh, mostly male, but it's here, right? But there's, we have a few females, um, you know, 20, 24 to. I guess 24 to 40 would be our highest, heaviest population, but then there's older too. But you know, there's, yeah, there's a tech pickup problem with the older, the older you get. So. Good stuff. Thank you guys are all done. Lunch is being served. We'll be to get on the other hallway, and it's good stuff. Thank you. Thank you.